Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Sister Carolyn Osick. Sister Carolyn Osick is a religious of the Sacred Heart and the Charles Fisher Catholic Professor of New Testament Emerita at Bright Divinity School of Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. She holds her doctorate in New Testament and Christian origins from Harvard University and taught for 26 years at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago before continuing on to Bright Divinity School. Carolyn Osick is a past president of the Catholic Biblical Association and of the Society of Biblical Literature. She was the second woman to hold the presidency of the Catholic Biblical Association and the fourth elected to lead the Society of Biblical Literature. She has been associate editor of the Bible Today and the New Testament book review editor for the Catholic Biblical Quarterly. Carolyn Osick is the author of numerous books, commentaries, articles, and essays, many of which are out front for 20% off, folks, at the end of the day. Some of her celebrated titles include a Woman's Place, House Churches in Earliest Christianity, co-authored with Margaret MacDonald and Janet Tulloch, and published by Fortress Press. Also the book Ordained Women in the Early Church, a documentary history, edited with Kevin Madigan and published by John Hopkins University Press. The book Beyond Anger on Being a Feminist in the Church, published by Paulist. And What Are They Saying About the Social Setting of the New Testament? also published by Paulus Press. She has written commentaries on Galatians, 1 Corinthians, Philippians, and Philemon, also the Shepherd of Hermas. She is the editor of the 15-volume Message of Biblical Spirituality series, published by Liturgical Press, and one of four editors of the highly acclaimed resource, Silent Voices, Sacred Lives, Women's Readings for the Liturgical Year. In addition to her academic work, Carolyn Osick serves as archivist for her congregation, the Society of the Sacred Heart, United States Province. Over the years, Carolyn Osick has remained a powerful role model for women, an organic intellectual who loves both scripture and the Christian tradition, and cares deeply about women's religious experiences and women's gifts. On behalf of the School of Theology and Ministry, it's a great delight and privilege to welcome today Carolyn Osick, who will be presenting Women Disciples, Leaders, and Apostles, Mary Magdalene's Sisters. Carolyn Osick. I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon, and this is really a, a very large and, and impressive group. Why are we engaged in this celebration. All of this celebrating about Mary Magdalene. Well, we're talking about this woman whose name was Marie or Miriam or Mariam or something like that from a fishing village of Magdala, that's the Aramaic name, or Migdal is the Hebrew name, or the Greek name was something different, Tarche. That's actually what it was called in her day. But it's interesting that the Gospels preserve the, uh, the original name. Magdala is Aramaic and, and Hebrew is Migdal for tower. But Tarake means something different. It means salt fishing or f salted fish, something like that, which probably says uh, the, the, um, the major um, business that went on there. She's called a disciple. She's called is apostolos, equal to the apostles in the Greek tradition. Apostola Apostolorum, Apostle of the Apostles in the West, recipient of revelation from the risen Jesus, prostitute, reformed prostitute, <laughs> desert ascetic, sometimes confused with the legendary Mary of Egypt. Much of it, it's very interesting to look at the whole history of portrayals of her because she, she becomes this person out in the desert with the skull and all this kind of stuff, you know, but still just titillating enough, you know, to, to um, um, stir up a little interest in her. The secret wife of Jesus and the bearer of his child in the Da Vinci Code. And today she really is a lightning rod for issues of women's discipleship and ministry. Will the real Mary Magdalene please stand up? <laughs> And assuming that she probably isn't going to, uh, 
I, I will just reflect for a moment on my own understanding of Mary Magdalene. Or, you know, we all sort of we all sort of construct our own Magdalene. Um, uh, I see her really as a middle-aged woman, uh, not young and beautiful. Uh, of course, the older I get, the older she gets. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, probably a widow and probably a person of independent means. You know, of course, that in the Eastern Church, she never became a prostitute, uh, which is very interesting. That only happened in the West. Here's the place she comes from, uh, where the blue arrow is pointing. The map says Tarake and Magdala on the, uh, the west side of the lake. And here's something of what it looks like today. <laughs> uh, it is being excavated. The site is being excavated now. Uh, and they have discovered just recently a synagogue, which they say is a pre-70 synagogue. The evidence, I think, is still out on that. I'm waiting to see it. But um, it would be very exciting, certainly, because uh, people say, well, is this the synagogue that Mary Magdalene attended? <laughs> Um, but the, the, there is excavation going on there today, which is a great thing because eventually, in some years from now, we will be able to visit the site again. But if you want to know more about the excavation, go to magdalaproject.org. And it's a website in both English and Italian, whichever you prefer. But we are going to turn now to some other of Mary Magdalene's sisters. And I started out by a, with a long list, and it was too long, and I said, I can't do all this. And I finally got it down to seven. And in choosing seven, of course, we have to leave out some wonderful people, some wonderful women, but that's just the way it happens. So we're going to talk about Priscilla, Junia, Phoebe, Evodia and Syntyche, Sophia, Guilia Runa, and Victoria. You probably know something, or maybe quite a bit, about Priscilla and Junia and Phoebe and maybe even Evodia and Syntyche, but I'll bet you don't know much about Sophia and Goelia Runa and Victoria. So this, is, um, this spans about uh, four centuries, and these are women that I think it is really um, worth our getting to know. And as we go through this, I want to ask you the reflective question for yourselves. With whom of these women do you tend to identify? Uh, which of them are the most appealing to you? Uh, do, do you have a favorite? And that's, that's just for your own reflection. So let's go first to Priscilla. So this is Priscilla, the wife of Aquila, of course. And she's part of a couple ministry they are uh, they're, they're a missionary couple, an evangelizing couple. Their names are both Roman cognomina, that is, uh, personal names uh, of, of, uh, that are well known in, uh, actually in the Roman elite. Aquila, though, is supposedly a Jew from Pontus. Pontus is way up north, north central Turkey, north central Asia Minor. And we really don't know anything about where they came from. They first appear in Rome. Uh, Paul meets them, however, I shouldn't say that. Actually, they first appear in Corinth, because that's where Paul meets them, but, but they had just come from Rome. We don't know if Priscilla was a mother or a grandmother. And we don't know anything about household members traveling with them, which presumably would be the case. They would have a whole household of slaves. Uh, if they are people of means, and, and they would all travel together. So, it, it, But Paul then later on says that uh, he took up with them because they were of the same trade, being tent makers or leather workers, uh, whatever that means. So they're a business couple as well. And they had this family business of leather working, and perhaps their movement around is for the sake of business. But where they go, they really become evangelizers. So in Acts 18, Paul in Corinth found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Paul went to see them, and because they were of the same trade, they, they stayed together. So they meet in Corinth, and then they set off to the east. Uh, Paul is, is going uh, back to Palestine, but in Ephesus, in Asia Minor, he leaves them. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, 
The churches of Asia send greetings to the Corinthians because 1 Corinthians is written from Ephesus. So he says the churches, and, and it's the capital, of the commercial capital anyway, of the Roman province of Asia. The churches of Asia send greetings. That's what it means. It means just this little Asia. It means just this little piece. And Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord. So we know that uh, Aquila and Prisca have um, host a house church. But then, when Paul writes Romans, some years later from Corinth, he says, greet Prisca and Aquila. And so it seems as if they're back in Rome. So they, they must have traveled around a bit. Uh, and greet, greet them, who work with me in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life. And we do not know to what that is referring. And it's literal. It, it, it's, a, it's an image that works in both Greek and English. It's literally what he says. They risk their necks in Greek for my life. And I give thanks at all the churches of the Gentiles, of the, of the nations. So something, some event has happened here that put Aquila and Prisca, Prisca and Aquila, in Romans, in that order, in danger for the sake of Paul. And there are a number of stories in Acts where Paul barely escapes, you know, it's a great adventure story. There isn't one about Prisca and Aquila. And so we're left to conjecture, to imagine, but Paul says it very clearly here. Um, that he is so tremendously grateful to them for what they did for him. And here is the here are the distances that that they travel. You see, from uh, Rome uh, on the left side of the map, they meet in Corinth in the center, and then they take up in Ephesus in Asia Minor. And according to Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, which we think comes. At, toward the end of his life, they're back in Rome. And um, they are, um, therefore, traveling around. Now, when they host a house church, what kind of a house are we talking about? And here are five possibilities for the, the kind of place that uh, they might have had, have owned, lived in, and hosted a group that would come in. This very large and spacious one from Pompeii, a much more modest one, also from Pompeii. The house of so-called House of Diana in Ostia. This is really an apartment building, in which there were three floors and uh, and private apartments. And so it could have been something much more modest, like an apartment. But then, of course, the numbers would be greatly reduced. In Rome, there is this apartment building that is uh, f f preserved in in part here. Uh, those of you who have been to Rome, you undoubtedly remember what's called the Wedding Cake of Rome, the Victor Emmanuel Monument. That's it. That's the big white wall right behind this. So this is just nestled around the corner from that big monument and, and fortunately has been preserved. Uh, it, it was one of these apartment buildings that were uh, very frequent in, in uh, Imperial Rome. So... Um, and then, then here we have um, in Ephesus f shops in the front and living quarters behind. Again, something very small and very uh, modest. And so uh, still a, a, a final one in Herculaneum, the courtyard of one of these apartment buildings. This is the only common space in that building. Besides this, it's apartments. So starting with that beautiful, spacious house and then coming down to something very small, we, it's, a, it's a whole range of available space. And so we just don't know exactly what it means when they host a, a church in their house. could be very small. Now, um, every time there's a nature picture, it's time to pause and, and reflect <laughs> before we move on to the next one. <laughs> um, and I, I neglected to say before that um, this, uh, this event of Aquila and Prisca leaving Rome because Claudius had, had ejected the Jews from Rome, it's an event that probably happened in um, the year... Um, 49. And we don't know that all Jews left Rome, but 
certainly some of them did. What does a hosting a house church involve? Just let's reflect on that for a moment. Certainly hospitality, not just once a week, uh, but ongoing. It's a center for news, for networking, for instruction, for hospitality to visit visitors. All the while children are being born and raised, and business conducted from the house. They don't commute to work. That's not the way it worked. Everything is happening at the same time in this one place. So hosting a house church is not uh, something that um, um, is, is a once a week thing, and that's, that's important to realize. So we have Prisca and Aquila here. We turn to our second woman, Junia, with her husband, Andronicus. This is in Romans 16, 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives, or it could mean people from the same region, who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me, before I was. Uh, a number of interesting things there. They were in prison with me. We don't know where. Paul certainly was, it seems to have been in, in prison somewhere when he's writing the letter to the Philippians. There are a number of candidates for that, for where it was. But they are prominent among the apostles. Now you can take that in two ways, in, in the Greek as well as in English. Either they are apostles, they're in the group of apostles and they stand out, or the group of apostles knows them well but they're not apostles. You understand that the, the grammar can work both ways. And uh, there have been, uh, lots of ink has been spilled about this, and, and probably, grammatically, the, the, the preferred way is to say that they actually are among the apostles. Some people dispute that. But they dispute it on ideological terms. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, so if we take it that um, they are indeed among the apostles, uh, and they, are, they were in Christ before I was. So they accepted the faith, faith in Jesus, before Paul. Well, who are the apostles? That's the question that is provoked here. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 8, Paul is enumerating, it's a, like a creedal statement, it's something he has heard, he has memorized, and he's writing it down when he's talking about the resurrection. He, Jesus, appeared to Cephas, then the twelve, then more than 500 at one time, most of whom are still alive, but some have died. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, to me. Now, um, if that's a continuous list, then the apostles and the twelve are not the same. Hmm? Uh, some people say he's combining two lists. One list is Cephas and the twelve and five hundred. The other list is James and the apostles, in, the, in which case the twelve and the apostles would be the same. But, uh, you know, it's never appealed to me. I think Paul's intelligent enough to know when he's combining two lists, you know. Um, <clears throat> So for him, the apostles, um, it, 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 all the apostles, it's, it's a larger group than the 12. And one uh, scholar, Richard Balcom, has suggested that, that Adronix and Junia were among the 500, uh, which is possible. You know, he, just, he drops this comment that the risen Jesus appeared to 500 at one time, and we never hear a thing about it, you know? So it's one of those really great um, mysteries about all of this. And so that's interesting. See, that would make sense then that they would be in Christ before he was. And, and this is just to say that, that we're not sure who all the apostles are, but certainly it's quite clear here for, with Paul, it's a larger group than the 12. So they are then, um, we assume, among the apostles. Moving now, but <laughs> um, you may know about John Chrysostom's argument in the, the late 4th century. He's commenting on uh, Romans 16, and he says, 
What a wonderful woman Julia must have been that Paul counts her among the apostles. Hmm. So in the late 4th century, Chrysostom, who is a great admirer of Paul and a wonderful biblical exegete, reads it that way, that, he's, um, uh, that, that, that Junia is among the apostles. In the uh, 13th century, um, a man named Egidius of Rome, a commentator, um, says, well, it can't be a woman if the person is an apostle. And therefore, Junia becomes Junias, uh, a, a male name. <laughs> so test your translations when you go home. Romans 16, 7, look. If it says Andronicus and Junia, uh, the interpretation is that it's a woman. If it's Junias with an S, the, they're following the interpretation, which was traditional from the Middle Ages into the, the, into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, then they're following the interpretation that this is a man. So that's Junia. We move to Phoebe. Phoebe, who is a local leader in the area of Corinth. We know, again, nothing of her marital status. Again, she might be a widow. She seems to be moving fairly independently. In Romans 16, 1 to 2, Paul is writing to the Roman community, and he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Kencray. Kencray is one of, the, it's one of the seaports of Corinth. It's the east seaport of Corinth. So that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, which is a usual word that he uses for, for believers, and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. This is the NRSV text that I'm using throughout this. And uh, that's always a stickler. What word are they going to say there? He, uh, this is benefactor, which is certainly better than some translations of helper. Actually, I think the best translation would be patron uh, of many, um, including myself. So Paul calls her three things there, sister, diakonos, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and prostatis. He calls her sister, and that's, uh, that's simply the, the familial language, the kinship language that was used in the communities. Uh, Paul often uses that kind of language. And then he calls her um, a diakonos. We sometimes translate that deacon. Uh, and that, that's okay. Um, th there has been some study done of what the, the word diakonos means that early on, and certainly it's connected somehow with service. Uh, it is also connected with agency or representation. And so she could be uh, a deputed agent, a representative of the group, the, the, the church at Ken Cray. Perhaps, as a patron, she's something like this Eumachia, famous woman in Pompeii, Eumachia, who uh, was a benefactor to many different groups and, and uh, had a statue erected to her in her honor. But uh, this, this idea of prostatis, it's hospitality, networking, uh, that kind of thing. And the comparison is often made now with Junia Theodora. Junia Theodora was a woman, not a Christian, in the 40s or 50s of the first century, and her tomb was found, a Roman tomb, uh, in 1954, about one mile southeast of Corinth in a cemetery. And there were several inscriptions in her honor on a single block, and they were probably copied from uh, inscriptions that were set up in different places in the city previously. She was from Lycia in Asia Minor, and it said that the citizens of Lycia honor her for her prostasia. So you see, um, if Phoebe is a prostatis, what she does is prostasia. And here we have some spelling out of what that means. In the case of Junia Theodora, it was hospitality and networking for the people from her home place who came to Corinth on business. And it was maintaining a good relationship with the local authorities. And one person has suggested that she was a lobbyist. <laughs> 
So it gives us a basis of comparison, you see, for what Phoebe would be doing for Paul and for others. Remember, Paul says she's a prostatus for many, including me. So probably what it means is that when he came into uh, the Corinth area, she, first of all, took him in, hospitality, but introduced him to the people he needed to be introduced to, you see, and uh, perhaps helped with uh, whatever um, the trade that he was working at, uh, which Paul himself says he really did at Corinth. He never wanted to be beholden to anybody. He worked with his own hands. So, um, so um, Phoebe may be that kind of a person. I think quite likely was that that's the kind of thing that she did. Now, when you go back to what he says to her in Romans, uh, you see that he, that Paul is now introducing her. Uh, it's a reciprocal thing. Uh, she now is going someplace where she presumably has not been before. Uh, where Paul knows some people, read Romans 16 sometimes, he, he's name dropping, he, is, he names 26 people that he knows in Rome. He wants them to, he's, he's not been there before, but he wants them to know, I know some people there, you know, I'm not coming in totally unknown. And Phoebe, it seems, is the bearer of his letter. And so he is introducing her and saying, do, do for her what you would do for me. You know, and because she, she has been really good for me. Now, if she is the bearer of his letter, then she probably is also the reader interpreter of the letter. Because that was the usual thing. The person who carried the letter was also then entrusted with reading it. And, I mean, you can kind of imagine this session of reading and somebody stops and says, now, what, what did Paul mean by that? And you have to answer what you think he meant by that. So there's interpretation going on as well as the reading. Now I just put in here a couple of things to, to illustrate what that means. Remember that they're, they're using capital letters at this point. No punctuation and no spaces between words. So uh, I just picked out um, a passage from Luke. Uh, which is Luke's uh, version of the Our Father. And because that's familiar language, you probably can, can read it pretty well. But that one's not quite so familiar, and it takes a while to try to read it. So reading is, is quite a skill. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different skill than uh, we do at lecturing on church, at church on Sunday morning, you know. Um, there's a whole, uh, you, you have to know the text really to be able to do it well. So, our friend Phoebe, uh, who is um, entrusted by Paul with his letter, um, a person obviously of means and with connections. We turn to Evodia and Syntyche. Their names mean happy travels and lucky. So happy travels and lucky are uh, two women in the Philippian community. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, uh, in chapter 1, he sort of talks about himself. And then in chapters 2 and 3, he launches into this appeal for unity. Uh, it is in the course of that, in chapter 2, that he gives what we call the Philippian hymn, Let That Mind Be in You, which was in Christ Jesus, who did not consider being on the status of God something to cling to, but emptied himself. So that's part of his whole appeal to relinquish some of your claims in order to have harmony, mutual agreement. Hmm? And just at the beginning of chapter 4, he says this. Now, many commentators take this as an, oh, by the way. You know, Paul has launched this beautiful argument for, for unity. Oh, and then he voted in Syntyche, who aren't getting along very well. Yeah, you, you do it too. Um, I read it differently, that, Evodian, that the disagreement between Evodia and Syntyche 
is the thing that is tearing the church apart. So he says to them, and it's very solemn language because he repeats the verb. I urge, that's NRSV, I, um, I beg. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's strong language. I urge Evodia and I urge Syndicate to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, and, and uh, that really, uh, the real word is yoke fellow, and nobody knows who's being referred to there, but obviously the Philippians did. Help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. We don't know who this Clement is either. It is not the Clement later on uh, from, from Rome. Um, Origen, the great third century biblical interpreter, thought that this loyal companion was Paul's wife, whom he had left behind in Philippi. That's an interesting conjecture. But somebody there is supposed to uh, referee between these two women, Evodia and Syntyche, who seem to have this very serious disagreement with each other. Now, it has also been suggested, and it's possible, that their disagreement was not between each other, but it was them together against Paul. Um, that is a possibility. Um, I, I think the, the, um, the larger possibility is the other way. That, um, that they are not agreeing with each other. And it, it's the only, uh, it, it, um, it, it, they're the only people he sort of singles out in the letter. Now he mentions Epaphroditus before that and, and he's sending him back, etc. But I mean, there's this kind of focus on the, on the appeal that these two women should work out their differences. So why is their disagreement so important? Well, at the very beginning of the letter in the first verse, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who in Philippi with the episkopoi and diakonoi. Uh, eh, nobody ever knows exactly how to translate that. Um, are you going to say bishops and deacons? Well, okay. But to use the word bishop, episkopos is the word that becomes bishop, but to use the word bishop is just so anachronistic at this point, you know, in the 60s of the first century, not anything like what we imagine a bishop to be. So a uh, superintendent, overseer, manager, it's a secular word that means those things, you see. But... This is the only letter that Paul addresses to a community and singles out roles like that, functions. All the other ones is just to the holy ones, to the saints in. Yeah. So, um, so maybe this community was sort of uh, um, one of the leaders in identifying certain roles and having uh, leadership roles and having sort of a job description for them. Many people think that um, the leaders of the house churches were the people who eventually formed, as this rolls on, eventually formed um, like a council for the city, out of which eventually down the pike, not here, but later, one is elected as a first among many, and then you, you evolve into the, the office of bishop as we understand it, you see. So I just wonder, if uh, Evodi and Sintike are perhaps episcopoi, that is, leaders of house churches who, have, who bear that title. And th it is their disagreement that is causing all this difficulty. Now, I put in here 3 John uh, 1, 9 to 10, which is by another author, entirely different uh, situation, but I think it illuminates this. This is the... Johannine author, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. That's, that, that's the NRSV translation. Literally, it says he does not receive us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he's doing in spreading false charges against us. And not content with false charges, he refuses to welcome the friends and even prevents those who want to do so and expels them from the church. Do we have here an entirely different situation, an echo of perhaps what's going on with Evodia and Syntyche in Philippi. 
Uh, in other words, that they are very influential leaders in the community, but they're not saints, you know? Uh, and Paul appeals to them to resolve their differences. I might just comment uh, on diakonos there, because I meant to on Phoebe and I forgot. Um, you know, Phoebe is called, in, in Kenkrae is called a diakonos. Um, she is the only person named a diakonos of a specific church in the New Testament. I mean, here we have diakonoi, but they're not named. Unless Evodi and Syntyche are also diakonoi, that's a possibility. Uh, do they have families? Do any of these women have families? Would they have portrayed their their funerary monument, something like this family um, connection. This is in the um, Pio Cristiano Museum in, in the Vatican. Or this one, also a, um, a Roman depiction of a family. I think the pictures bring them home a little bit to us. Huh? We turn now to people that you're probably not at all familiar with, unless you've been reading some of this, this literature about uh, women in the early church. A woman named Sophia in Jerusalem, late fourth century, we think. In 1915, this uh, monument, this, this inscription that you see on the left, was discovered in several pieces on the Mount of Olives, in a cemetery context on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. It was pieced together. You have a, a transcription of it on the right side so that you can read the letters a little more clearly. And it says, Here lies the slave and bride of Christ, Sophia the deacon, the second Phoebe, who fell asleep in peace on the 21st of March, and then it gets broken off. And there's something later about the Lord God. So it's probably something like, may the Lord God give her peace or something like that, you know. And uh, we don't have the year, uh, just the, the, the um, day of the month. But it's it, late 4th century is what um, the archaeologists think. So here we have someone who is... A deacon, and it's the the word is again diakonos, um, not deaconess, but by the late fourth century, uh, she is the same as a deaconess, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I want to talk first about this second Phoebe. The second Phoebe. I, I, it's fascinating because, first of all, it tells us they're reading Romans, and they are also remembering the character, Phoebe, the person, Phoebe. She has somehow become a, a heroine to them, and we have very little evidence of that, of, um, of people remembering um, some of those New Testament characters, you know? And so she's the, uh, Sophia is called the second Phoebe. And there's been a study on that, that expression, the second something or other. It's usually said of men, uh, and it's usually male, of course, male um, heroes. And it, it usually it means uh, some kind of an imitation of the qualities or imitation of the deeds uh, of, that, of the first one. And so... Is Phoebe, uh, is Sophia, sorry, is Sophia someone who is known for her hospitality? Uh, is it because she travels, <laughs> which Phoebe also did? Um, we don't know uh, exactly why that is. And so we're, we're left again with the question, where do they come up with this? But it's a, it's a piece of continuity, you see from the New Testament period into the fourth century um, in which they're remembering uh, the person of Phoebe, uh, the, the friend and the, um, and the patron of Paul. Now, she's also a deacon or deaconess. The words are, the titles are interchangeable. Diaconissa is deaconess or uh, sometimes the same person is called a, a, a deaconess in one place and a deacon in another. It's, uh, the, the, they use deacon uh, also for women throughout this whole period. The office of, of deaconess in the third to the fifth centuries, it's a true ordained ministry. 
It's instituted as a, for ministry to women by women. Uh, it is not the same thing as the male deacon role. Uh, it, it is a ministry uh, of women to women. And some important roles include assistance at baptism, baptism of women, because remember, baptism was by immersion, which means you take off all your clothes. <laughs> and uh, various parts of the body are anointed during the ritual. And so, and, and the, the office of, of deaconess was, was much, much more prominent in the East, Eastern Church than in the West. And, um, and it's typical, it was typical of the culture and still is in many parts of, of the East that, um, that male and female don't mingle easily, you know, that there are sort of separate spheres. And uh, the idea of a, of a male deacon or bishop anointing the body of the deaconess was mm, not kosher. And so one of the major roles of the deaconess was to, to be there to carry out that part of the baptism. But also instruction, religious instruction pre- and post-baptism. And, and <clears throat> taking charge of uh, female catechumens, for instance, in the story of St. Mary of Egypt, which I, I mentioned before, Mary Magdalene gets confused with Mary of Egypt, who is this legendary um, figure from the fifth century, probably. Um, she's a famous prostitute and uh, um, goes, decides to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and she tries to enter the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and some invisible force keeps her back. She cannot walk in. She's instantly converted and then goes to the bishop, and the bishop turns her over to a deaconess, a woman named Romana. And so that, you know, is another little insight about the role of, of deaconesses, of, of taking care of women who need to be taken care of, and, um, and then gradually instructed and prepared for baptism, etc. Pastoral ministry to sick women uh, was a very important part of the deaconess's role. And the accompaniment of women who were traveling on business or uh, other, other reasons for travel, pilgrimage to... There is a deaconess who was buried at the uh, monastery of St. George Koziba uh, in, the, in the Wadi Kilt on the way between Jerusalem and uh, Jericho. Uh, in the cemetery there, which was excavated, they, there was a, a, a deaconess who was buried there. Now, that's a male monastery. What is that deaconess doing buried there? Well, she probably died there on her way to Jerusalem or uh, on the way back home. So, uh, you know, another indication of, of, of a deaconess who is traveling. Um, so all of those roles were important for, uh, for the deaconesses. If you want to know more about that, the book by Kevin Madigan and Carolyn Osick, Ordained Women in the Early Church, it's, it's back there. So that's Sophia. And we turn now to Guilia Runa, Presbyterissa who lived about 40 years. It's a Latin inscription. And it comes from this, the Church of St. Augustine in Hippo, but it comes from after the time of Augustine. Guilia Runa, as you can guess from the name, is not Latin, she's not Greek, she's not Jewish, she's Vandal. The, uh, the barbarians from the north who had come across through Spain, across Gibraltar, and into North Africa, and they were making their way across North Africa, heading east. As Augustine lay dying in 430, they were coming really close to Hippo. Uh, and the Vandal invasion happened just after he died, so I think about a month after. And we don't know much about these people. They were Christians. They were Aryan Christians. Uh, we know very little about their liturgy or about their church organization. 
And the interesting thing is that the, the inscription is in Latin. So they picked up Latin when they got to North Africa. Latin was the, the common language. And so we have a woman here who is called a presbyterissa. A presbytera would be enough to make it feminine, but presbyterissa, uh, an extra feminine uh, ending on it, like diaconissa, deaconess. You know? Again, we know so little about her. It's possible with these inscriptions of women presbyters, we have, you have to be very, very careful because presbyter, presbyter and the female feminine presbytera can mean simply elder. So it can mean just an older person. And yet sometimes it seems not to mean that. It, it seems to mean something else. For example, there's another inscription from South Italy of a woman named Leta, Leta Presbytera, uh, who, whose husband dedicates the inscription to her. She has died. And the husband doesn't even give his name. Uh, and, and the argument goes that she must really have had the office of presbyter, whatever that means, uh, because otherwise he would be the important person in the inscription, you see. Or there's a woman from, from um, Dalmatia up north, uh, Croatia, that area, uh, named Flavia Vitalia Presbytera. There's an inscription that's not a funerary inscription. It's uh, a, an account of how a man named Theodosius bought a piece of property, of church property, from her hands. She was the agent. And so again, you say, if she represents the church in the sale of property, it's not just that we're calling her an elder person. I mean, she's, she, she has the title of presbytera. And you may know about the famous um, uh, letter of Gelasius, Bishop of Rome, in around 494 to the bishops of South Italy, saying, um, things have gotten so bad there that we hear that uh, that women are allowing t uh, to to stand at the altar and to assist at the altar. Stop it. Uh, so, uh, so something's going on in South Italy, you know. Um, and so we we sort of put all this together, and you know, it's here and there in the Mediterranean. We've got these these pieces of evidence of women um, as presbyters. Um, and we really are not sure what that means. I mean, this is at a time when the normal celebrant, shall we say, of the Eucharist is the bishop. And uh, presbyters, we think, maybe out in the country, or the, uh, out of the city are the celebrants. So it's an evolving situation, obviously. But, um, but we do have these, these interesting pieces of evidence of women <clears throat> who, are, who have the title presbyter. And uh, here is Guilia Runa, the Vandal. Finally, Victoria Sanctimonialis. I know you have not heard of her unless you've heard me talk about her. Because this is someone I discovered, and um, we know not enough about her to say a whole lot. I've always thought in another lifetime I would write a novel about her, maybe. She lived in uh, 5th century uh, Thuga, or uh, today it's Duga, North Africa. It's in Tunisia today. Uh, it's a, it was quite an extensive city. Sanctimonialis is a word that is known in the early church in the West, and it means a consecrated virgin. So whether she was living in a community or whether she was as a hermit or an anchorite, I mean, we don't know exactly, but that's what the word sanctimonialis um, means. This cemetery was excavated in 1915, and the only thing I've ever found published on her was about one page. Um, a, a report on the excavation of the church. It's a small church, as you can see, 
On the top left, you can see two people standing there, one of whom is yours truly. And, uh, in, in, and then to their left, as you go down to the, to the left side of the picture, you see the apps of the, of the church. So it's a, it's a small, it's a little chapel. Okay? And you may be able to see, as you look directly below the two figures, there are two sarcophagi at the bottom along the side of the wall there. You see these empty sarcophagi, stone sarcophagi? And there are actually more than that. You, you, can, dis, you can see those too. Both walls on the outside of the chapel walls are lined with them. They are all over. Lots of people wanted to be buried right in that area. Now, top right picture, that's yours truly again standing there, and you see the steps that go up into the apse, into that little apse. And between them, you see an opening. Hmm? And the opening, if you, if you look down at the opening, you see, miraculously I'm down there at the bottom again, um, that, but that's what you see. Uh, there's a staircase from the side as well that goes down into this opening. So when this church was in use, you had this, the small nave, and it had columns. It was supported by columns. You can see some of those column bases in the top right picture. And it had that opening right below the altar. And to get up to the altar, to the sanctuary, you had, you had to go up those little steps to go up into the, the apse of the church. And so what's down there below? Right below the altar is this tomb, which was broken open. Um, there's nothing in it. Uh, tomb robbers got to it a long time ago. Um, but you see the tomb itself on the, the left picture and a close-up of the inscription on the right. And it says, it's in the dative case, which funerary inscriptions are, to Victoria San Santimoniale. It's, it's misspelled. There's, the C should be in there. Vittorie Santimoniale in pace, in peace. So two Victoria Santimoniales in peace. And as I walked around that church, and I've been there twice now, um, and, and as I walked around it, what I realized was everyone wanted to be buried as close as possible to this tomb of Victoria. So who was she? I mean, we know she was a consecrated virgin. Uh, too late for her to be a martyr. You know, she's not a martyr. She was probably an ascetic, a holy woman who was venerated in the city. And no written sources about her that anybody knows of. But it led me to reflect how many holy women have come and gone and we have no record of them. Mm -hmm. So what do they all have in common? And what do they have to teach us? All these nameless women who married and bore children and raised children and educated children and produced food and made clothing and ministered to the needy and instructed believers and led prayer and presided at meals and assisted at baptisms, and even stood at the altar. They teach us that forms of ministry arise according to need, that family and community life is apostolic, that everyday life is holy, that women leaders arise in every generation and do not let obstacles prevent them from addressing needs, and so much more. If Mary Magdalene could have only known who was going to come after her and remember her and go and do likewise. Thank you. <laughs>